All right, good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm Chris Stecker, and we're, today we're gonna have a great class on vegetable gardening with uh, Extension Horticulture Agent for Alamance County, Mark Danieli. Um, this is a great class. It's time to get your fall vegetable garden going. And if you have questions, I ask that you please put the questions in the chat box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Excellent. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mark and uh, hopefully we can get this show on the road, Mark. <laughs> okay, can you hear me, Chris? Yes, I can. Okay, okay, all right, so. You know, it seems like the end of July is a strange time to think about fall gardening. You know, it's 97,000 degrees out there and it seems like fall's a long time away. Uh, the other problem is our summer garden, at least mine, is late, late. So May was cool and rainy. I just started picking tomatoes like last week. So pretty much 30 days behind uh, where we should have been. I picked the first peppers probably this past weekend. Uh, everything is behind, but you know, if you wanna have a fall garden, uh, now's the time to start thinking about it and actually start planting. So the problem is gonna be for me, I've got a very small garden space. Uh, my wife likes tomatoes very much. Do I dare pull up her tomato plants to plant my broccoli? I don't know. Um, I think about that a little bit and have that conversation, but there's a lot of things that we could be planting uh, for our fall crop. And these, generally speaking, will do better in the fall than they do in the spring. So you could plant all of these cool season crops in uh, February, March, and, and have a spring crop. But a lot of times it gets too hot too fast and they just don't do very well. So if we get them planted for the fall season, you got a better shot at having these things mature and have a, a better fall crop than you would have uh, planting in the, the springtime. Uh, so we always start with planting, and that's something that uh, we talk about all the time is decide you know, what you wanna grow and draw a little bit of a diagram and think about the planting dates. Uh, crop rotation is very important because you can have all kinds of disease problems built up in the soil if you continue to plant the same thing year after year. So we've got a real good planting guide here for fall that tells us you know, what you can plant when. So you look at uh, broccoli, so July 15th. So we've, we're already two weeks into the broccoli planting season and people will sometimes tend to plant their broccoli way over in September, which is okay, the plants won't die, but you may not get as good a head as you want by the time uh, cold weather gets here. Uh, if you need, need to go ahead and get that in the ground uh, pretty soon. I like broccoli very much, so I'm gonna try and get mine in by uh, mid-August if I can find a spot. Uh, so that's a very good publication. We can send that to you on the email. What this publication doesn't give you is row spacing. So it gives you a spacing between plants in the row, but not between rows, which is really important to me. So. Uh, White Quarles has a vegetable planting guide here that I like very much, and it gives you, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, distance between rows here, so you've got a, a column there that tells you what is the space in between rows. We're trying to, to be very efficient and then plant as much stuff as we can in a small space there, so that's a, a super uh, beneficial thing to have the distance between rows. Of course, all this is very complicated trying to figure out what to plant when and where. And I'm more of a, a visual kind of person. So Chris had made this chart for me, which is really helpful. So I can go in here and look at, you know, July and August and see uh, with these colored bars, here's all the things that I could plant in the fall. So there's four, seven, 10, 13, 14 different crops I can plant in the fall. And so these colored bars are sort of planting dates. So uh, for, let's see, beets. So that's first of August to the end of August there. Uh, broccoli, mid-July through the end of August. 
Uh, so all of these things, this is a real helpful chart to have so I can figure out what to plant when. All of these things, I obviously can't plant them all. I don't have enough space, but I'll pick out perhaps uh, broccoli, cabbage, maybe some Brussels sprouts. My wife likes those, but there's only a few things I can do. Uh, last year I had carrot, spinach, and lettuce. Uh, for some reason, the squirrels decided they wanted to eat lettuce. So the squirrels ate virtually all my lettuce before I put up some netting to control them. So, you know, you always have somebody else who wants to eat what you're trying to grow. So we're trying to think about then, as we're still planning, you know, how much of this stuff you want to have. Uh, are you going to can or freeze some of this stuff? And Eleanor's done some uh, canning classes already this year, so she can help with that. So you want to think about how much of these things that you actually want to do and when you want to plant it, because you want to make sure to get this stuff planted in time for it to mature like the broccoli before cold weather comes. And you may want to have uh, multiple plantings too. So that's going to be super important. If you plant everything at one time, everything is ready to harvest at one time. So several years ago, I decided I was going to plant broccoli and I planted maybe four dozen plants at one time. And I like broccoli a lot. The problem is all of it came in at the same time. So you've got a whole lot of broccoli there in a couple of weeks time. It's hard to handle that. So you got to freeze it. You got to give it away. You got to do whatever. So now I'm trying to maybe plant a dozen plants every couple of weeks in the season. So it all didn't come at one time. So that's not a problem necessarily with, spinach, lettuce, collards, the leafy things. You can plant them all at one time and you just pick leaves off as you want to and that's not a problem. Uh, but the thing is like my broccoli that's making a head, uh, you really gotta be careful about not planting all that at one time because that can be a bit of a problem. And you're talking about the planting, then how often to plant depends on how quickly they uh, grow. So you got quick maturing things, uh, the lettuce, the uh, radish, mustard, uh, they mature very quickly. So you need to plant those successful, uh, successive plantings on those fairly often, but not necessarily because the lettuce, uh, mustard, all these things um, are okay with one planting. And then the longer season crops, uh, broccoli and, and collards there, you want to space those out a couple of weeks apart, but it does take a long time for broccoli to mature uh, in the fall. So it could be uh, up to 90 days before they get mature and make a nice head for you. So intensive garden is what we're trying to do is get as much as possible in a, a fairly small space there because I have a very small garden space. Uh, most everybody else does. So we want to make sure we're trying to get as much as we can out of uh, what we've got. Uh, preparing our soil is going to be super important to add the organic matter to improve our drainage and, and aeration. But it does require a uh, real careful uh, planting there. So I've got a picture here. So this is a uh, cabbage probably. I think there are four rows of cabbage in like a three foot wide uh, space um, and a three foot wide aisle there in between the blocks. Uh, but as these plants grow, they grow into the aisle. So your aisle ends up being probably really only 18 inches wide, but you've got a real thick uh, planting there in the bed. So it's very efficient, uh, using your space well, and having those plants in there fairly thickly uh, shades out weeds and helps control some of the weed growth that you would have there. So that's, that's also very helpful. You know, as you're looking for a site, most everybody already has their site picked out. You know, sunlight's going to be the most important thing to consider. You know, if you're starting a new garden this fall, if you don't have sun, uh, you're going to have trouble. So you can modify the soil and you can work on irrigation for the water. Uh, but if you don't have adequate sunlight, you're going to have a little bit of a problem there to get plants to grow successfully. Uh, definitely need to have at least six hours. Uh, minimum full sun for our leafy stuff uh, going into the fall. And so that's going to be real important to find that sunny spot that's going to be uh, work well for you. So if you don't have good sunlight, obviously you're not going to have good plant growth there. Uh, you can put your rows north to south to help a little bit, but you've still got to have 
uh, sufficient sunlight in order to have good production with whatever you're trying to grow in the garden. So location and size, you know, for a new garden, um, they say start small, but a thousand square foot garden may take you a half an hour a day, which is fine, but that's a half an hour every day. So if we have some rainy periods or you're out of town, uh, the next thing you know, you've gotten behind and the weeds will grow much faster than anything else and you can get in trouble uh, if you start too big. So you wanna start small and build up to something that you can reasonably manage without a whole lot of trouble. We talk about soil preparation, that's always uh, very critical for anything we wanna grow. Uh, soil testing is important there. So the soil uh, lab in Raleigh, NCDA lab is doing a soil test now. We have the boxes and information sheets here at our office. So our office is closed at this time, uh, but the front door is open so you can go in, uh, get your soil test boxes, get the information sheets, take your soil samples and mail them to Raleigh and get the report back to tell you what you need to have to add to the soil as far as fertilizer and lime to get the soil where it needs to be to grow uh, good plants. Uh, obviously you need to add organic matter to improve the drainage and aeration. So that's gonna be a real important part of the soil preparation uh, process. Real quickly, we'll hit on fertilizer, because that's very confusing to a lot of people there. So a 10, 10, 10, the, those numbers are just the percentage of nutrients in that bag. So the first number is nitrogen, second number is phosphorus, third number is potassium there. So it's 10% of the bag, whatever size it is, uh, is nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium there. So it's important just to know what these numbers represent. And it could be any kind of analysis. So it's a 10, 10, 10, 10, 20, 20, 16, 4, 8. Uh, depending on what the soil report tells you, that'll give you an idea of what fertilizer analysis that you need to get. The analysis is the important part. So if you look at these two products here, you got a tomato, a vegetable, plant food there. So the analysis there is 12, 10, 5. Uh, tree and shrub fertilizer 1177. If you look at the analysis, these things are pretty close to being the same. So we don't really need to worry about the name on the bag, the brand of the product. The analysis is what's going to be important to match the analysis of the fertilizer with what the soil test report um, tells you. Uh, got these holotone, uh, tomato tone products here, and nothing wrong with these products at all. But again, we want to look at the label, and you see the analysis here the holotone uh, 434, tomato tone 346. So it's virtually the same product. So you could use holotone on tomatoes, vice versa. It doesn't really matter that a lot of those tone fertilizers out there, and nothing wrong with them, uh, but the analysis tends to be very, very close together. So you don't need to buy six different fertilizers. You can find one that is pretty close to the analysis that you need according to the soil report and just go with that. And that's perfectly fine. The plants don't know the difference between holly tone and tomato tone. The only thing that really matters is the ratio, the components, uh, nutrients there. So here's a soil report here that they changed this a few years ago to make it more user friendly and just made it worse. Um, but we can help you with that. So if you get a soil report uh, back from your soil test and you look at this and don't really know what it's, what it's saying, uh, you can call us, call me, call Chris. We can look it up online and sort of walk you through the report recommendations and give you an idea of what you need to add to the garden. So this one here talks about uh, five pounds, of a 2100 per 1,000 square feet, what that's telling you is that nitrogen is all you need. You have adequate phosphorus, potassium in the soil already. There's no need to add any more of those nutrients. A straight nitrogen source is all you need for the garden to grow adequate vegetables, whatever you want to grow. Um, but again, so that is a little complicated. There's pH things in there, lime recommendations. We won't spend a lot of time on that, but just suffice it to say, soil tests are very, very important, and we can help you with the uh, analyzing the report. This one here 
is about a 21.00. The second sample down, a little harder to see, is a 15.014. You know, it may be the case that we look at that and go, okay, we'll find you've got a small area. We probably wouldn't recommend buying two different fertilizers for that. Uh, we might use the 21.00 in both cases and might still be fine. Uh, or maybe we use uh, a 10 10 10 uh, to avoid trying to buy two different fertilizers for a small garden plot, which just seems a little bit wasteful there. Uh, okay, so site selection still, talking about soil. Uh, we want to add organic matter, uh, raise the beds up where we can. Use containers in a lot of situations where your soil is poor or the only sunlight you've got is on the driveway or on the deck. You can use a pot there and still do a pretty good job of growing vegetables uh, in a container. So mending your soil is gonna be super important there. Adding organic matter, uh, not only does it help the soil hold water, also helps drainage and aeration. So both of those are gonna be super important there. Organic matter, we want to add uh, three to six inches and incorporate. So a leaf compost is going to be very good. Pine bark fines are going to be very good. Uh, either one of those will work. Uh, peat moss does not work well with our soil here, so I would not recommend that. So the leaf compost pine bark is going to be your best bets for adding organic matter around here. Uh, we're going to till this in. And so incorporate that organic matter to the soil, which is going to help improve our drainage and aeration. Uh, so we want to make sure that the organic matter we use is very well composted. So if you put in uh, green pine bark, uh, the microorganisms that break this stuff down, use nitrogen in the soil, and we can run into a nitrogen deficiency there uh, by using too green a compost there. So you may have a situation where you might need to actually add some more nitrogen in there. Uh, if your compost uh, organic matter is not well decomposed. So you can see here stuff on the right hand side, uh, very well decomposed, that would be what I'd use. You could use this other uh, less decomposed material, uh, but you may have to add some extra nitrogen there to help that uh, get decomposed without running to a nitrogen a deficiency uh, in the garden. Okay, so here the um highlighted bold manure things so we can definitely use uh, manure in the garden uh, something like a daddy peach or black cow uh, compost and manure is what i would recommend the problem with using manure off the farm is there are now herbicides that are used on hayland and pastures that are persistent and these herbicides will pass through the animal's body and be contained in the manure and can wreck your garden. Uh, so if I was gonna use manure from the farm, I'd want to know the history of the pasture or the hayland to make sure that they had not used any of these persistent uh, herbicides on that land that can come through the manure and cause you a real problem in your garden. Other than that, the compost, uh, pine bark fines, leaves, uh, can work very, very well. You do have to be careful with some of the commercial compost. Uh, some of them have a real high Lyman equivalency. Uh, so jack up your pH real high. They'll have a real high phosphorus content. It can jack the phosphorus index up. So still, if you're taking soil tests on a regular basis, you can see if these numbers are getting a little bit out of whack and then we can take steps to change over to a different uh, type of organic matter that won't give you a problem with either high pH or high phosphorus content. Okay, we'll move on real quick to uh, irrigation here. So we know trying to get an inch of water per week on the garden. So it's tricky and people get confused about how to water the garden and we've had some thunderstorms that kind of roll through here and dropped a lot of water, but it comes really fast. And so a lot of that water just runs off and doesn't soak into the ground. It's not uncommon for me to go out there and run my drip irrigation the day after we've had a thunderstorm because most of that water ran off and didn't soak in. The soil didn't get wet sufficiently 
for a good root growth. So what we're trying to do is when we water, we need to water very thoroughly, get the ground wet. Uh, you really can't water too much at one time. You can, however, water too frequent. So that's something you need to water very thoroughly, let the plant's soil dry down for a day or two or three, whatever. It's okay if it wilts a little bit and then water again. You don't want to be watering too often because that encourages shallow root growth. And in some cases you can end up with disease problems, uh, root rot and things like that. You can water with a hose by hand if you have a few plants, uh, it's, it's slow. Uh, you can use a, a sprinkler. Um, it's okay. The problem with sprinkler is you're getting the foliage wet and you can get some foliar disease problems with that. Uh, soaker hose and drip is going to be a, a better way to go because you don't have the problem of the foliage getting wet. Uh, so you're getting the water on the ground uh, where it needs to be. The foliage don't get wet. You don't have the disease issues you would have with uh, overhead sprinkler. A drip irrigation is going to be the, the absolute best way to go. The problem with soaker hoses is that you get a lot of water at the start of the hose, but very little at the end. Uh, where drip irrigation, the most of the lay flat tubing that's used for that has pressure compensating the emitters. So the flow is the same at the end of the line as it is to the start of the line. So it works very, very well. Uh, here's a little picture here of a simple drip irrigation system. So you've got a filter here. I hope you can see the cursor. You got a filter, you got a pressure reducer because these drip systems run at probably 10 pounds of pressure. Uh, the pressure coming out of the house, coming out of the spigot is probably 35 to 40. So if you don't have a pressure reducer there, you can blow these fittings apart. You've got a distribution line here. You've got two little valves to connect the uh, lay flat tubing that goes down through the row and the emitters in this tube in here are spaced every 12 inches or so. And so you can sort of see the circles where the water's coming out. Uh, as this thing runs, uh, the circles get bigger and bigger and they'll actually join together. So this whole row will get wet by using the drip irrigation. So fairly simple system, uh, easy to put together, not very expensive and really is the best way to water the garden. It saves you a lot of time and the water gets where it needs to be. Okay, so we'll start moving into the vegetable crops uh, that you might grow at this time of year here. Uh, so we've got some of the things that are half hardy that will tolerate a, a light frost and we've got some things uh, that are hardy that can tolerate a lot of frost and really make it through uh, probably all winter long with, with some care uh, on your part. So we're looking at planting dates there. So we look at things like Brussels sprouts. That's a real long season crop there. So, you know, really we're at the tail end of what the Brussels sprouts planting date is. Uh, same thing for carrots. We could push the carrots probably a little further over, but it takes a long time to make a, a carrot. So you need to think about it. If these are things that you want to grow, you need to think about trying to clear a spot out for them pretty soon and go ahead and try and get those in the ground. Uh, so if there's a long time to grow Brussels sprouts, they'll definitely do better uh, in the fall than they will in the springtime. In the springtime, it gets too hot too soon and they won't really form uh, the little Brussels sprouts that you're looking for there. So uh, this is gonna be the best time to grow Brussels sprouts if you're interested uh, in them. So carrots, we could do carrots now. Uh, if you've ever looked at the Johnny C catalog, they have got more different colors of carrots than you can imagine. Uh, I like the orange ones myself, um, but you could have all different color carrots if you want to. To trick with our carrots here is we've got to have really well amended loose soil. Uh, if you plant these things in the heavy clay, they're gonna go down about two or three inches and then quit growing. Uh, because the soil is just too hard for them to grow in. You also want to pick varieties that are a little bit shorter. So they have varieties of carrots that may be 12 or 14 inches long. That's not gonna work well in our soil. You need something that's gonna be maybe a six or eight inch carrot. Uh, if you have good soil, uh, that'll work better 
than some of the very long uh, carrot varieties that we can get. Okay, uh, rutabaga and kohlrabi uh, here. Um, something that Chris likes very much is kind of a strange looking thing to me and I don't really particularly care for them uh, at all, but these are things you definitely can grow uh, here and it's like a above ground turnip uh, kind of thing. Um, so we're moving into a little bit further into the year. So uh, mid-July to mid-August, uh, beets, broccoli, collards uh, need to be in the ground, ideally by the middle of August, maybe the end of August there, to make sure you're gonna get uh, a good crop. The collards not so critical because they are very hardy. And since you're just picking leaves, they can go on into the winter a long way. So broccoli is the kind of thing that uh, the frost won't hurt them particularly, but if you're looking for a nice big head, you've got to get those in the ground fairly early, especially if you plan to have successive plantings. So you don't want to have your first planting the first of September and then mid-September and first of October. That won't work for you. You could have a planting now, maybe mid-August, first of September, and probably be okay with that, but don't wait too late if you're looking to get a good head of, of broccoli. It takes a while for them to, to mature. Uh, beets, uh, you can go ahead and do those uh, kind of late August there, and they'll do very well with no problem. You can also harvest the, the tops if you would like to do that. Uh, broccoli, one of my favorite uh, cool season crops there. Uh, I would go ahead and use transplants just because getting seed to germinate this time of year when it's so hot is pretty hard uh, to do. Uh, and the great thing about broccoli is once you harvest the main head, you can get side shoots uh, that will develop later on in the year. And a little hard to tell these pictures of some broccoli I had in my garden several years ago. And I had cut the big heads and just left the stuff out there. Didn't clean the garden up and went back out. And I'm sure this was probably in January. And the broccoli plants had, had sprouted all these side shoots there. So I had a whole another harvest of uh, broccoli side shoots there. That I wasn't even anticipating. They just popped up on their own. So I'm glad I didn't clean my garden up uh, that fall. That worked out real well for me. Uh, collards and kale, uh, go ahead and set those out uh, fairly soon now, and very hardy. So we can carry uh, collards through the winter, no problem. So you can be uh, picking collard leaves and eating collards all winter long, uh, most years, and do do very, very well. We're moving now into our August uh, time period. So the whole list of things that we can uh, plant here starting to get into uh, time to do lettuce and spinach. Uh, really nice leafy greens that do super well uh, around here. Sometimes we have a little trouble getting these things to germinate in August. Being a cool season crop, the soil temperatures are very high. And sometimes you may have to plant these things two or three times in order to get good uh, germination on them just because the soil temperature is just so high and they would rather have a cool season, cool soil temperatures. Uh, cabbage here, uh, again, very hardy crop. Uh, you can set these things out and they're going to do uh, very, very well in the fall, perhaps better in the fall than they would uh, in the springtime. Uh, cauliflower is going to be another one we can do in the fall. We do need to make sure that we do get those in early. They're a little bit faster to mature than the broccoli, uh, but still we want to get those transplants in by mid-September uh, at the latest in order to grow uh, a good size head. And there are different uh, varieties of uh, cauliflower now that Johnny's has at all different kind of colors. It's interesting. Let us, uh, does very well here. Uh, it can be carried well into the winter with a uh, row cover. Um, the pelleted seed are a little bit easier to uh, plant and, and grow. The lettuce seed is very, very small. Uh, so you will have to probably plant this several times in order to get a good stand at this time of year. And there are just 
I don't know, dozens and dozens of different varieties of lettuces, all kinds of uh, colors there. Um, well, a lot of choices in lettuces that will do very, very well for us uh, here. The leaf lettuce here, you've got uh, different kinds of, of colors. Uh, you can get mixes that have all colors mixed to uh, gather there. So you, know, you can plant several rows of, of these. You can space them apart for extended harvest. But you know, once you cut these things off, most of the time they'll come back up and you can cut them uh, again. So they'll do very well for us. Once you get that seed to germinate and get the plant started, then you can go from there and then do very well with those. Uh, mustard and turnip greens there. Uh, going to mature a little bit uh, uh, faster. So you can get some turnip varieties that only produce greens and don't really have roots. You can get some that will do both uh, roots and top. Uh, so you've got a lot of choices there in turnips and, and mustards if you like those kinds of, of greens. Uh, turnip roots there, the many, many varieties of uh, turnips. Um, they mature fairly quickly. Uh, you do want to get them before they get too big. So they will, on occasion, if you're not careful, these things get up to softball size. And once they get that big, the root starts to get kind of tough and fibrous and stringy and doesn't do real well that way. So you need to watch them and try to, to get those roots up. Uh, when they say tennis ball size or, or so, don't let them get too big and, and tough. Uh, spinach, uh, very cold hardy. Uh, I've carried spinach over winter um, last year with some row cover, so I had spinach on till springtime uh, this year. I had to pull it up to plant the summer garden. Uh, works very, very well. Uh, many varieties of spinach, once you get this seed to germinate, these plants established, very cold hardy and will do very well. You can cut it, it'll come right back, cut it again, um, does very well for me. Okay, we're moving a little further into the fall, so mid-August, mid-September uh, there, uh, still kale, lettuce, radishes. As you get a little further into the fall, then onions, garlic, asparagus are things that you can grow, so if you've got a space uh, that you can permanently put into a garden, then asparagus is a, is a great perennial crop that you can plant out there and have asparagus uh, for a number of years. The first couple of years, you're not gonna have much. You've gotta get it established, so you're only gonna get a few spears the first couple of years. But once it's established, you can get a lot of asparagus in a, a fairly small space. Um, radishes here uh, uh, mature extremely quickly, so probably 30 days from seed to something you can harvest, so that works really, really well. Um, they do have the Dacon um, radish that can be used to um, loosen the soil up. So it's like a tillage radish there. So if you don't really want to harvest the radish, you can put those in there and they'll grow and help loosen the soil up. Uh, in some cases, uh, some of our farmers will actually do that. Uh, talk about seed real quick here. So you don't want to buy old seed. You make sure it's packaged uh, for the current year. Uh, keeping the soil moist is going to be super critical at this time of year. Temperatures, uh, air temperatures high, soil temperatures high. Um, what I had done on occasion, planted the seed, uh, watered the soil, and then put row cover over it. Uh, so that keeps the soil temperature a little bit lower and helps keep the soil moist so that the seed germinates. You've got to watch to make sure uh, that the Row cover doesn't sort of uh, mash down the new seedlings, but that does help in some cases to keep the moisture uh, on the soil and help the seed germinate. But still, uh, with anything, the lettuce, spinach, these things, uh, you may have to sow the seed more than one time in order to get a good stand uh, with this hot temperature that we're trying to deal with this time of year. Okay. So some things we would direct sow um, and some things we would do as transplant. So if I can get a transplant for my broccoli, cabbage, collars, I'm going to use a transplant. It's just faster. Uh, trying to get some of these seed to germinate uh, is problematic. I do 
sow uh, carrots, lettuce, and spinach. Um, I've got a real nice push spreader there. I can put the seed in and I can just do a row in a few minutes time and you know, wait a couple weeks. If I don't get a good stand, I just roll back over it again. And uh, usually after a time or two, you can get a pretty good stand of these things. And it is cheaper certainly to sow seed than it is uh, by transplants. Uh, seed sources there. So I like the White Corals seed. White Corals is a seed company out of uh, uh, Garner. Uh, so the varieties that they sell um, grow well in our area. So you've got to be careful how, where you buy seed. You can get seed uh, from some seed companies that won't do well here. I bought a lot of seed out of uh, Johnny's. There's a lot of different varieties of uh, lettuce, spinach, carrots, you name it. They've got a, a huge selection of things there and they will do well here. Uh, everything I've got from them uh, has performed uh, very, very well. Park Seed, Burpee, uh, all these seed companies uh, are fine. You just need to find the variety that you typically want to grow. They talk about the uh, thinning seedlings here. Uh, so if you were sowing, for instance, a turnip patch, uh, you would have to go through there and thin those out. Uh, what I do mostly is I plant everything in rows. And in the rows, I don't worry so much about thinning seedlings. That's real tedious and hard to do. So, you know, in my carrot row, I just sow the carrots and, you know, some of them just get kind of uh, uh, pushed out. You know, it's too crowded. Some of them don't do well. Others do fine. And for me, it just works easier. Uh, thinning seedlings on my hands and knees is just not that much fun. So uh, you can do that if you'd like to or you can just uh, sow rows, which is better than a patch, and still come out very, very well. Okay, we want to uh, talk about extending the winter harvest. So cold frames, uh, frost blankets are really uh, beneficial. You can make a little hoop thing, uh, like in this picture here, to keep the cover off of the plants, which is important. You don't really want that uh, row cover to lay right on the uh, plants, but you can make this with a uh, little wire hoops or a uh, three quarter inch uh, black poly pipe, anything really uh, that you can keep that fabric up off of the plants is gonna be uh, beneficial to you. Uh, so you can extend the life of our half hearted crops with the uh, row cover there. And certainly uh, this also helps the hardy stuff to go all the way through the winter. So the row cover is gonna be super uh important in extending the harvest season uh, of our fall uh garden there um we don't really have to worry about pollination for any of our fall crops so you don't have to worry about that i usually try to take the cover off unless i really need it because you can get a situation where you get excess moisture built up underneath the uh, cover and it can cause some disease problems there so if it's not going to go down below freezing, I'll probably just leave the cover off uh, most of the time and only pull it when I actually need the protection of the cover. But it does work very, very well. Uh, most of the time people use this 1.2 ounce cover. Uh, so it's going to give you pretty good protection down into the low 20s, yet it's still going to have pretty good light transmission. So you can get a thicker cover uh, but it reduces the light transmission there. And what you can do, and I have done, is go back uh, with two layers of the 1.2 or the one ounce cover to give you a little bit more protection. And then as soon as you are past that real cold snap, pull it back off so that the plants can get the light they need to, to grow. Not a real good picture here, it's hard to see. Uh, this is some lettuce we had planted out in front of our office. Uh -huh. Wow, 2009. Uh, made some real cheap little bamboo uh, stick hoops there, pulled the row cover uh, over it. Uh, you can see the lettuce that was protected here, with the row cover. There was lettuce on this other side over here and it just got killed completely. And I don't remember Chris, how cold it got at that particular time, but it was, I guess, low 20s. And it was uh, cold. 
yeah, took that lettuce out. It's the other lettuce with the row cover with a little protection there. Uh, did very well, so there's, there's no doubt the row cover will, in fact, work for us. Okay, we'll move into uh, pest management here. And so there's a lot of things about pest management there that you have to understand. So it's not just uh, go out and spray liquid seven the first time you see the bug. Uh, you need to think about what it might be. So what can you do um, as far as picking plants that have some insect resistance, some disease resistance? Uh, get out in the garden and scout monitor. So really important to, to be in the garden every day, every other day, uh, see what's going on and see if you start to get a few aphids, control them before they turn into 10,000 aphids. Uh, do the right cultural practices. Don't overwater, don't over fertilize. Make sure the plants are uh, happy and you won't have as many problems. Know the pest. Uh, you know, go out there, you just see some random bug. It may not be a pest. It may just be some random bug just landed and taking a little bit of a rest and moving on something else and it may not be a problem. Uh, if it turns out it is a, a problem there, you know, your first uh, go-to is gonna be a biological control. Uh, so in the fall garden, we're gonna have uh, problems on uh, cabbage and collards with a lot of different caterpillars. So there's a whole cabbage worm complex out there. You can control those real well with a BT product. So it's a bacillus thuringiensis, so a biological control. Um, you spray this on the plants, the caterpillars eat it. They're eating that bacteria, it gets in their gut and kills them. Uh, very effective on caterpillars and super safe for us. So you can use one of these BT products this morning you can harvest this evening, eat the plants fine, no problem at all. Uh, mechanical control, that's just picking the caterpillar off and squishing it. And that's very effective. Uh, not everybody wants to do that, but it will work uh, very, very well. And there are cases where you may need to use a chemical control layer, depends on what the pest is and, and the population. Um, we'll always look at what's called the pre-harvest interval. So, that's the time from when you spray until you can harvest. Uh, so some of these products have a very short, either zero day or one day pre-harvest interval, uh, softer products that are effective. Uh, some things have a longer pre-harvest interval. So you really need to look, look the label very carefully, see what that pre-harvest interval is to make sure that you don't spray something on whatever it is that you're growing that prevents you from harvesting that when you want to. So there's one of the cabbage loopers there. You definitely gonna have uh, one of these cabbage complex uh, caterpillars in your fall garden. You're absolutely gonna have them. Um, they are just gonna be there because if you plant it, they are gonna come. So uh, crop rotation not gonna help with uh, them. Uh, sanitation is gonna help with some of our uh, things there, but we're trying to mostly um, keep the garden clean do the cultural things that make happy, healthy plants, but you're still gonna have some insect uh, pests to deal with here. Uh, aphids are something you're definitely gonna see. Um, they can be a problem on broccoli, especially if they get up into the florets, it's really hard to get them out. And it's one of those things that you'll have a few to start with. If you are proactive, you're scouting, you're monitoring, get out there and see the aphids, you can take care of those. Uh, fairly easily before the population gets you know, too big and before they get inside the broccoli florets. Uh, if they're on a cabbage leaf, you can just wash those off and it's not a big deal. Um, you can see maybe on this slide here, these kind of brownish looking aphids. So those have been parasitized by a parasitic wasp. So uh, the wasp has laid a little egg there, killed the aphid, gonna make some new wasps there. But you can sort of see, you can go from a few aphids to a bunch in a very short period of time. So you really need to be aware uh, of aphid population and get on top of them before they get ahead of you. So you look here, there's lots of different things you can do. The, the pyrethrin, the neem, insecticidal soap, uh, all very effective. And the days here, this is pre-harvest interval. So these things are zero day pre-harvest interval. You can spray this morning with insecticidal soap. You can harvest your broccoli at night, eat it fine, no problem. 
uh, from Ethan goes to a one day marathon, depending on the crop, can be up to seven days before you can harvest. Um, I can't tell you which crop that is. You have to look at the label to see, uh, but any of these things that you use, you need to look the label very, very carefully because it's going to be restrictions as to what you can spray it on, which crop, and what the pre-harvest interval uh, is with any of these products. So the whole cabbage worm complex there, uh, ported cabbage worm, cabbage loopers, you can see the adult moths. You know, so if you were really careful, you could get out there in the garden, you'll see these moths flying around. You know the caterpillars are not far behind, they're getting ready to lay eggs. Uh, a lot of these things out there, and they can devastate your crop if you don't stay on, on top of them. Uh, there's a broccoli plant there that's been chewed up pretty bad. Um, so you can pick them off, mechanical control works very well. You can use uh, row covers. Uh, to cover these plants over, keep that moth from getting on the plant and, and laying eggs. Uh, the VT products, like we talked about earlier, dipal thoracide, excellent. Uh, that's really my go-to on any of these cabbage worm things. Uh, thoracide is a liquid uh, formulation. You get better coverage there. I like those uh, very, very much. So that's really the go-to on any of this cabbage worm complex is the VT products there. Uh, very effective and a zero day pre harvest interval uh, works extremely well. So, row covers will definitely work uh, for those. You do have to pull them off and on, uh, which does give the moth an opportunity to get in there and lay an egg. So, that's probably not your primary control uh, for that, even though it does help keep the moth off the uh, plants somewhat. Okay, so we've got the uh, broccoli and uh, turnips here. So we've got flea beetle damage. So it's very, very common uh, in our gardens. Um, Insecticidal soap, neem, pyrethrin. So uh, still all the zero day pre-harvest interval. So spray this morning, pick this evening, it's fine. You look down at carbaryl, can be up to 14 day pre-harvest interval. So that can mess you up. Uh, if you're expecting to harvest something and spray this uh, without really thinking about what you're doing, uh, that puts you two weeks out from harvest. So uh, with anything, read the label, see what the label says, what the pre-harvest interval might be to make sure you don't mess up your harvest. Okay, moving on to diseases. We're going to have a lot of diseases on our fall garden here. So these are fungal leaf spots. Often there is one of them. So Broccoli, cabbage, collard, spinach, turnips. Uh, a lot of these plants are going to have uh, leaf spot diseases, especially if we have a wet period. So a lot of moisture on the leaves. These uh, fungi can uh, germinate, infect the leaf, and you're going to have a leaf spot like this could be a problem. Uh, downy mildew is a big problem. A lot of our fall uh, crops here can affect a lot of our things. Downy mildews can be a real problem. It can destroy the whole entire plant where the alternate area of some of the leaf spots, not that big a deal, uh, but downy mildew can just take the whole plant uh, out. Powdery mildew, again, very common uh, in the fall garden there. So lots of diseases to be concerned about. Um, rotation and tillage works for some of the soil varieties, not so much for the foliar things. Uh, there are some varieties of our fall crops that have some resistance, but not entirely. Um, sulfur and copper, again, going back to the zero day uh, pre-harvest animal there, work pretty well, but you've got to be careful on sulfur about air temperatures. So if it's going to be above 90, anytime within two or three days after you spray, uh, sulfur can be a problem and get some phytotoxicity there. Uh, copper, repeated use of copper uh, is not good either. So you've got to be kind of careful of these things and you can move into something like the Dacanil or Manco Zeb, uh, depending on what the crop is, uh, will be a difference in the pre-harvest interval. So again, like anything else, you've got to look at the label to see uh, what is it labeled on, what crop, what disease, and what the pre-harvest interval might be. All right, so that's kind of quick and dirty on the fall garden. I want to see if I can stop sharing here, and then Chris can tell us. All right. If we got a question. Got any, 
If you have any questions, there's one question here, and okay. anybody else have any questions, just put them in the chat box. Okay. Okay. Oh, there's two. Um, how the first one is how long does it take to get results? And I believe that's from the soil test. Okay. And right now I just submitted some, and it's they're recommending two weeks. So um, two weeks. Oh, wow, that's quicker than I thought. Once they get it. <laughs> so, uh, and they do have to mail them now. So right. So that's still that's pretty good. That's pretty good turnaround at this point in time. And um, okay, and, and one more thing about the soil test results. I took my soil tests into the post office, and the po the zip code on the on the sheet I used was incorrect. Oh, but she changed it for me. So um, if you have one of the older forms, which I think I may have had an older form, it has a it has an incorrect address, a zip code. Oh, okay. What ounce row cover do you recommend? I probably do the one point two ounce. That's what I use and had good luck with that. Okay. And those those are all the questions. Are there any other questions before we sign off? Oh wait, here we go. I've had snails and baby slugs under the row covers I've used in the fall. What kind or what can I do, I think is what she meant. So okay. what do you, what what's this? What's this? Well, you, you can you can use uh, inexpensive beer in a little shallow bowl, and they like that very much. And there are slug baits that are labeled for vegetable garden. I think it's um, iron phosphate. I can't tell you exactly what that is. I have to look that in the book. If you wanted to call me, I can look that up. There's some of the slug baits do not have a garden label but there is at least one that does okay um the, this one says can we get the powerpoint as an email mm. uh, i think it can be converted into a pdf and sent out if yeah. we have email addresses right if you would if you email us at uh at extension we can send that to you as a pdf yeah, the, the powerpoint itself is, is such a big file it won't email but um i feel fairly sure as a pdf it will and this but this recording will be uh available on at youtube later today so if you if you want to just check later today and re rewatch it <laughs> uh, you can do that Okay, so now, let's see. You're getting ahead of me with the questions. Um, I grow vegetables in a pot. Can I reuse the soil? I would say yes. So unless you have some kind of a, a root disease, as long as the plants are growing well, I'd say you could definitely reuse the soil. Okay. Now, not forever. Uh, if it's like an organic uh, pot and soil mix over a period of time, it will decompose and, and the drainage will get worse. And so for uh, some of my potted plants, I usually change the soil out once a year just because it will decompose and, and drainage is not as good. But, you know, as long as the plants are going well, you probably use it for a couple of years. Okay. All right, snails and slugs are tearing up my garden right now. Well, again, same. <laughs> right. And so whether, whether it's that the beer or, and I think it's an iron phosphate. Um, yeah. Slug bait. I, I have to look the book to be 100% sure. So if you want to call me on that, I can look it up and tell you for sure. Okay. And if here's someone recommends that you sprinkle the slugs with salt and watch them melt. Um, <laughs> well, yes. If your sadistic side can be satisfied <laughs> doing that. I wouldn't put a lot of salt on the vegetable garden if I were you, but uh, yeah, um, not good for soul. Remove the slug first and then put the salt on it. Ah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Oh, and the next is thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and resources. I love this program and thanks for thankful for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Kim, Kimmy Massey. And um, okay. yeah, I wish we could do it in person, but that's. You can't do that. Yeah. Well, maybe someday. Someday. <laughs> someday. <laughs> well, it looks like that's all the questions. And uh, so we'll, uh, we'll wind it up now. And um, 
I will get busy on editing the recording. There you go. So if anybody has questions uh, later on, you can feel free to call or email uh, yeah. me or Chris, and we'll be glad to help you any way we can. All right. All right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you.